We can also relate this to um, variations in Earth's atmosphere um, and weather are also related to pressure and gases. Um, you know, just, just we're thinking about breathing. Think about wind. Where does wind come from? Yeah, it's uneven heating of the Earth's surface, which causes differences in pressure of the air. So if we look at variations in the atmospheric pressure, I just said that when we breathe, we reduce the pressure in our lungs and the external pressure is constant. Well, it's relatively constant. So if you watch weather reports, they'll often pull up maps like this and they'll talk about high pressure and low pressure systems, right? So high pressure, an elevated atmospheric pressure is usually associated with clear weather and low pressure is usually associated with unstable weather. And so it's these differences in pressure in different parts of the earth that cause a lot of our weather and cause wind. We've got this little digital weather station here in the classroom. If you ever, you know, come up here and look at it. Today, the pressure is 30.29 inches of mercury. Um, and so that is kind of medium. But then it, it'll give us a little, here it's got sort of a partly cloudy to cloudy little icons here. Well, how does it predict... How does this little thing predict the weather? Weather Is it talking to the guy at KC24? No. It's looking at changes in barometric pressure, atmospheric pressure. And so if the pressure is high, it's going to predict that things are going to be less stable. And if it's low, it's going to predict more likely, you know, sunny. Um, we also see variations in the um, atmospheric pressure as you move above the Earth's surface. So the number of gas particles in a given volume, the concentration of the gas, if you will, decreases with increasing altitude. When we're talking about gases, we usually talk about pressure rather than a concentration, but those things are related to each other. As you go up, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, decreases. So the pressure of a gas is related to how many gas particles are in a given volume. So we just got done talking about um, molarity, right? The moles of a substance per liter of solution. So if we look at these two jars with gases in them, could we calculate the molarity of the gas? how many moles of gas in a liter of the gas. We don't usually think of it that way, but that's really what we're talking about. This has more gas particles in the same volume, so this is a higher concentration. The result is also a higher pressure because each of these gas particles is hitting the walls of the container. Sometimes I like to think about gas particles as being a bit like kindergarten children. Um, if the teacher's not in the room, they tend to kind of run around and bump into things, right? If we have a few children in a room, there's going to be a certain number of collisions. If we increase the number of students in that same area, volume of the room, there are going to be more collisions, right? And that results in more pressure for a gas. Pardon me? Yes, they are directly proportional. Another um, real-life effect of gas pressure and atmospheric pressure is what happens in your ears when you um, go up in an airplane or when you go up in the mountains. Um, so I took my, we took the kids up to the snow um, a couple of weeks ago when there still was snow. Um, and as you're driving up that hill to uh, Grant Grove, your ears pop, right? What, why do they do that? It has to do with gas pressure. So here's an illustration of your middle ear. You have an eardrum, 
And then on the inside, there's also a cavity that has air in it. And that is connected into the back of your throat by this little tube here called the eustachian tube. So normally the pressure inside in the inner ear and your middle ear is equal. And so your eardrum's all happy and it vibrates and you can hear very nicely. So as you go up the hill and the air pressure outside decreases, the internal pressure of your ear does not change as easily because that eustachian tube is small. And you know, really, do you want soup getting up into your ear? No, you don't want stuff getting up there. So it's good that it's that way. But then the pressure inside is higher and the pressure outside is lower. And that causes your eardrum to bulge out, which normally is just sort of a mildly uncomfortable feeling. And then you yawn or swallow and you hear that popping sound, which is air leaving your inner ear. And then everything's okay again. Now, if you've got a bad cold and you're really congested, or if you have an ear infection and your ear hurts anyway, that pressure imbalance can be excruciating. And you, you're probably aware that babies tend to cry on airplanes, which is extra frustrating because you're all in this like sardine can and you're stuck with somebody else's screaming baby, right? Babies cry because their ears hurt not because they're trying to make you miserable. Babies have very even smaller eustachian tubes and so it's harder for their ears to um, balance. When you come back down, the reverse happens. Now the pressure outside becomes greater and it causes your eardrum to bulge the other way. And then again, you have to get your ear to pop and let gas, let air into your inner ear. We call that your ears popping because it's kind of what it sounds like. Anybody have any questions about that? The reason that chewing gum or yawning or swallowing can help is because that, that movement in your neck area helps to open that up and, and let the air go in or out. How do we measure pressure? Well, we have a lot of modern tools for measuring pressure, but we're gonna look at the original pressure measurement device, the mercury barometer. So the original mercury barometer was a very simple device. It was a long glass tube filled with liquid mercury that was inverted into a dish of mercury. Now, if this tube was open at the end, the mercury in here, of course, would run out, but this is closed. And if you played with water and cups in the bathtub as a child, you know that if you have a cup of water, um, you, you have a cup under the surface of the water and you turn it upside down and you lift it up without letting the lip come out of the water, the water stays in the cup, right? That's kind of cool. As a child, you're like, ooh, this is fun. And then when you lift it up out of the water, all the water rushes out. Well, you were essentially making a very crude barometer in the bathtub. So the reason that liquid mercury is used is because it is much more dense than water. When you played with this in the bathtub, you didn't see any what appears to be air forming up here. This is actually not air, it's a vacuum. And so here we have a column of mercury and why does it stay up there? Because atmospheric pressure is pushing down on the mercury on the outside. Atmospheric pressure pushing down supports the column of mercury here because in order for this to fall out, this liquid has to come up and the atmospheric pressure is holding it down. So Torricelli was the guy who first discovered this and he found that if he took this device and went up a hill with it, mountain, that the column of mercury would get shorter and shorter and then if he came back down, it would go back up again. And so he realized that this 
the height of the column of mercury was related to the pressure of the air. And so this is measured, um, it can be measured in inches, 29.92 inches, like the 30, what was it, 30.21 30 now, inches of mercury that this barometer is giving us, or 760 millimeters of mercury. And that is literally measuring the height of this column of mercury with a ruler. So the millimeter of mercury is a pressure unit. Average atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. So as you go up in elevation, the pressure will decrease, the height of the column of mercury will decrease. The unit millimeter of mercury has also been given um, the name Tor in honor of Torricelli. Uh, so one Tor is the same as a millimeter of mercury because the length of an element seems like a really weird pressure unit, right? Um, and I kind of think they intended that Tor would replace millimeters of mercury, um, but instead we now just use both of them. So that just added to things. There, of course, are other pressure units. Um, atmosphere. An atmosphere is average atomic pressure, I'm sorry, average is atmospheric pressure at sea level. Um, so an atmosphere is abbreviated ATM. One ATM is the same as 760 Tor. So the way this table works is that all of these numbers, these measurements here, are equal to each other. One tor, sorry, one atmosphere is the same as 29.92 inches of mercury, 760 tor, 14.7 psi, which is pounds per square inch. Force is, I'm sorry, pressure equals force divided by area. Pounds per square inch makes sense when you think of it this way because a pound is actually the force due to gravity divided by square inches, that's the area, pounds per square inch. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, which is a Newton per square meter, it's abbreviated PA. Um, that's a much smaller unit. So 101,325 pascals is equal to one atmosphere. The, one that you should, the ones that you should remember is the 760 tor and one atmosphere. I'll actually give that to you on an exam, but we're going to do that conversion so many times that it'll save you a lot of time if you can remember that. So 760 tor or 760 millimeters of mercury is how high the column of mercury is. And an atmosphere is like, is one atmosphere of pressure, right? So are you gonna be able to walk down the street and find a place where there's three atmospheres of pressure? No. The variation in atmospheric pressure at a given elevation is really quite small. Um, so a lot of times we'll say about one atmosphere, and that's close enough. So let's look at how to convert pressure units. And this is dimensional analysis again, just with some different relationships. So your local weather report announces that the barometric pressure is 30.44 inches of mercury. Convert this pressure to PSI. The nice thing about how the pressure units are given to us in the textbook is that we can always do this in one step. So I don't need to go from, um, well, these are next to each other, but if I had an atmosphere, I don't have to go through Pascals and through PSI to inches of mercury. These are all equal to each other. So I just pick out the two that I need and I can do the conversion. So 30.44 inches of mercury, convert to PSI, I need one term. I want my new unit on the top and my old unit on the bottom. And then I'm going to go to the table and this is how I'll give it to you on an exam. 
and I'm just going to put the numbers in. 29.92 inches of mercury is equal to 14.7 psi. So my calculator, as often is the case, is giving me a whole mess of digits. How many of those should I keep? Yeah, three. So this 14.7 is not an exact relationship. The 760 is exact. The rest of these, um, well, this 760, of course. But 29.92, not exact. 101,325, not exact. So four sig figs, three and four. This should have three sig figs. And so I should report this as 15.0 PSI. It bothers me that the book uses 14.7 instead of 14.69. I don't know why he did that. But Any questions? Another simple um, device for measuring pressure is called the manometer. If you look, just look at the word, the manometer, does this measure men? No, it doesn't. I'm not sure where that came from. But um, the manometer is used to measure the pressure of a gas inside of a container. And again, this is a very, very low tech way. You don't need electricity or anything. You just need some glass tubing and some mercury and a ruler. So the manometer is this part right here. Um, here we have gas at a high pressure inside this container. And so we connect that to the manometer and there's liquid mercury in the manometer. And so the pressure of the gas is pushing down on this side and atmospheric pressure is pushing down on this side. If the inside was the same as the atmospheric pressure, then the levels of the mercury would be equal. But here, this gas is pushing down. This is at a higher pressure than atmospheric pressure. This does not tell us directly the pressure inside, but it gives us the pressure inside the container relative to outside. So we can measure the difference between this column of mercury and that column of mercury. H, and that's the difference in pressure between inside and outside of the container. If we know what atmospheric pressure is by using a barometer, then we can figure out what the pressure is inside. Um, so why do we use mercury instead of water? It's a lot more dense. So if we go back to this barometer one, an atmosphere of pressure will support a column of mercury that's 760 millimeters, so 29.92 inches. The one time I want a ruler, they're all gone. Okay, it's, it's about this long. Okay, it's about that long. If I made this barometer with water, it would be 30 feet tall. That's not very practical, is it? Wouldn't fit in their room. So mercury is really useful for that. In fact, only a few years ago, each of the classrooms had a mercury barometer on the wall. Ooh, there's mercury in the classroom. It's fine. But, you know, people freak out about it, so they made us take those down. And now we have this boring digital weather station that keeps running out of batteries. 